Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, this is the fourth week in our Unshakable series where we're looking to find out how we can have a faith that is genuinely unshakable in the face of all the fear around us today. And so today, I'll just tell you right off the bat, we're, we're jumping into Joseph. When we're surveying people who have a faith in God that has withstood the fires of fear, it's impossible not to consider the life of Joseph. Moreover, the story of Joseph extends beyond the circle of Bible scholars and into the vernacular of theater and the secular world. He is a story that is known, and it's a, it's a gripping story of evil being repaid with kindness. A story of, of hope in some hopeless situations. A story of good triumphing over evil. However, when we look at the story of Joseph in a way that focuses our attention on the engine that kept him going, it requires a, a deeper dive into what could have been. Uh, to think about this, we need to consider a, a variety of worldviews, and I, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey, so stick with me here. But before I go there, let me share a disclaimer that this will be a very quick survey of worldviews, and there's a strong likelihood that I won't do any of them justice. Uh, very quickly, we can, we can hack everybody's worldviews into two streams. Uh, either there's, there's nothing more that we can see than this natural realm or, or attribute to our thought, or there is something more than what we can see in, this natural, in the natural realm and imagine in our minds. I don't want to argue with people. I don't want to belittle other people and, and what they believe or, or don't believe. Instead, I want to spell out why I believe what I believe. There are three reasons for my belief in the supernatural, which I'll define as life and existence outside of the natural, outside of the natural world. Uh, first, uh, and people are going to get their feathers ruffled about this, I haven't heard a convincing argument about how everything began outside of creation. And what I mean by that is, is I haven't heard somebody just hit me in the face with, this is how the world began and had nothing to do with anybody or anything outside of, uh, outside of nature. Uh, the world's beginning has not yet been explained well enough by a naturalist, in my, in my opinion. Something coming from nothing literally contravenes the laws of nature. Today, there are several theories uh, regarding origin of life. But those theories can be boiled down to a, a faith in something that is currently seen as impossible. It's the hope that we will figure this out with our minds, how this could be true, only including nature. Like I said, I'm skimming over these things pretty quickly. Uh, the teachings, this is the second one for me, the teachings of Jesus just make sense. Some may get wide-eyed when I specify the, the teachings of Jesus instead of referring to the entire Bible. Uh, my simplest response to this is that Jesus is the star of the story. God points to him in the first book of the Bible and then comes back to him again in the last. But it's his teachings uh, found in the Gospels that, that resonate with me in this context. Uh, the life he lived and the, the things he taught are, from my perspective, absolutely perfect. They're flawless. There's literally nothing that he says or does that I wouldn't run, uh, run up the flagpole to celebrate. And those of you who know me know that I'm, I'm slow to jump into a camp when it comes to different ideas and different strong opinions, especially that you'll, that you'll, you'll hear today. I, I, I tend not to go to these places, but when it comes to every single thing that Jesus did and taught. Uh, I'm a fan. And I'm an unabashed fan. Um, uh, just another kind of addendum or add-on to point number two. Uh, I, I've taught about this quite a bit, so that's probably why I didn't write it in my notes. But the historicity of Jesus, the verifiable life and teachings and, and occurrences that happened in Jesus' life are overwhelming. Uh, no one can say that Jesus didn't exist. And not only did he exist, but we've got these records of his teaching. And, and this is something that um, I said off the bat, I don't want to argue, but this is something I'd love to engage with 
you about if if you disagree with this because man i i just think there's just so much evidence we've got more evidence for the life and person of jesus than we do of alexander the great it's just a fact and again like i'd love to talk to you more about that point three the third reason for my belief in the supernatural is that i've seen the difference that jesus makes in my life along with the front row seat to the to the miraculous which I would say is literally defined as things that don't occur according to the laws of nature. I have personal experiences when it comes to what my life looks like when I live it my way versus God's way. In matters of health, peace, and joy, God's way has proven itself to be better for me 100% of the time. They're pretty good odds. So those are the main reasons for why I believe that there's more to life than what we can see, hear, touch, taste, feel, smell. I don't know if I've got all the senses or not. So that was kind of the first process of figuring out what you believe. Do you believe that everything is just what we can see? Or do you believe that there's something more? So I've, I've established I believe there's something more. And from a posture of believing in someone or something outside of nature. It's a matter of boiling down what you believe about pantheism, spiritism, polytheism, and theism. For, for the same reasons I mentioned, I find myself believing that there is one true God. This belief is, is shared by Christians, Muslims, and, and Jews. Incidentally, not that it's a popularity contest, but over half the people of the planet profess to belong to one of these three groups. This is despite the fact that the most densely populated uh, regions and areas around the world, are pr they predominantly believe something other than Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Narrowing down my belief in the God that is, uh, narrowing down my belief in the God that is described in the Christian Bible is actually pretty straightforward and simple. As I mentioned earlier, Jesus is central to my belief system. In his own words, he describes the Father. So just that in itself is enough for me. Other cults and religions, uh, this, is, this is key. They involve an additional prophet or prophets with prophecy that ventures well beyond the boundaries of what Jesus teaches. Where other beliefs rely on the word of a man who claims to have uh, been given a truth in the, in the privacy of a vision or a visitation, Jesus was God incarnate, delivering the word to the multitudes. He, he led a very public ministry and lifestyle, one that's, that's widely verifiable. Then, this is where it gets a little icky, uh, within that category of Christianity, there are denominational streams that can appear to be negatively divisive. And two quick words about denominations and different Christian teaching. One, on one hand, denominations can be seen as different flavors of the same church. In, in Maple Ridge alone, there are several different denominations representing several different styles of meeting as the church. I believe that the churches I'm thinking of are all pointing to the same God. Moreover, I believe that the things they're teaching about and about him are properly aligned with his word. On the other hand, there are some who call themselves Christians whose eccentricities both blur and cross over the boundaries set by God. Uh, in South Africa, I encountered the Zionist church who call themselves Christians but practice snake charming and other culturally influenced rituals. This sounds completely extreme to us here in North America, but we fall prey to similar cultural influences uh, for example, prosperity teachings are done from a, a Christian pulpit, but they draw from ideas that are distinctly non-Christian. They're, they're cultural. They're not Christian. So, you may be sitting on your couch wondering when you're going to hear the part about, uh, you're going to hear the part about the coat of many colors. Uh, we're going to get there. For now, I'm hopeful that we can build this firm bridge that shows why it's important to know what you believe and why you believe it. You see, Joseph believed in the one true God. Uh, and more than believing, he had a relationship with God. So while I have a, a belief in the existence of Justin Bieber, 
I don't have a relationship with him. And, and don't ask me why I use Justin Bieber as an example. Uh, but many, many people believe in God. Interestingly, we read in James something about this. It says, you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. That's in James 2.19. It's not just about believing in God. It's what Joseph believed about God that created a faith bond that endured. God spoke to Joseph in dreams. Uh, the dreams must have been as vivid and real as the colorful coat Joseph was given. See, I told you we'd get to this part. It was so vivid, or the, the dreams were so vivid and real, that he just couldn't keep them to himself. Oh, if he just could have kept them to himself, he could have spared himself a lot of trouble. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of the details of those dreams, you can read about them in Genesis 37. Uh, and the main events of Joseph's, uh, the life of Joseph can be found between Genesis 37 and 47. But the first dreams are, are pivotal in the life of Joseph. So I do want to share what he saw. This comes from Genesis 37 verses 6 to 11. When he was sharing his dreams with his brothers and then his father. He says this to his brothers. Listen to this dream I had. Sounds exciting, right? We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed to it. And his brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. And it says here they hated him all the more. Joseph already had a bit of a reputation for being a, a tattletale and a goody-two-shoes, and, and the brothers were already kind of done with him, but this was putting him over the edge. Now, Joseph didn't learn from how well this was received and he came out with the next one then he had another dream and he told his brothers listen he said i had another dream and this time the sun the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me when he told his father as well as his brother as well as his brothers his father rebuked him and said what's this dream you had will your mother and i and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. See, I've been, I've been thinking about how Joseph shared the contents of his dreams with his brothers and father. At, at first glance, he comes off as socially inept. Um, in, in the musical, he's just referred to as the dreamer, and obviously that's talking about the fact that he has these important dreams, but he's just kind of like head in the clouds. He, he comes off as socially inept. He appears to be completely tone deaf when it comes to his ability to read the room. But it makes me wonder if Joseph has worked out more in his own mind than he was able to share. What if Joseph shared the story knowing that it was God who was authoring each step? Now, what if, in, in Joseph's mind, God was the hero of the story and he only saw himself as one who was playing that story out? Uh, many of you will remember the time that I referred to myself as Carolee's gift to the church. Uh, it came off the same way as if someone declared themselves to be God's gift to women or something equally awkward. Uh, hopefully, I've attempted uh, to interpret what I meant enough times that you will all know what I was trying to say. I wasn't describing the gift. I wasn't saying what a wonderful gift I am to the church. I was pointing to the giver. I was saying that Carolee has been very generous with her time, with our family's time, in allowing me to go and do what I need to do uh, as a minister in the church. But I'm not going to keep going there because I'll just keep digging that hole. Uh, when we look at the life of Joseph, it doesn't appear as though pride or arrogance, even ambition or striving, are things that Joseph struggles with. He never appears to self-promote, so it stands to reason that his reasons for sharing his dreams were less about elevating himself and more about declaring God's promise for him. Or he may have just gotten carried away with enthusiasm about, about what God was going to do in his life. Well, you know. uh, the dreams were so real that he just couldn't contain himself. He had to share and share those dreams with those closest to him. And this led to all sorts of problems. But the dreams were so real 
that he just couldn't let them go. This is what kept him going. After Joseph shared his dreams with his brothers, things went progressively worse and worse. His own brothers were so put off with him and by him that they plotted to kill him. Uh, reason prevailed and they saw a way to make some money, so they sold him to some slavers who were passing by instead. Uh, these slave traders then sold Joseph into slavery under the captain of the guard in a strange land in, in Egypt. Uh, let's pause here for a second. Imagine that God had made you a promise. A promise to make you the sheaf that all others would bow, bow down to. A promise that the sun and the stars would bow down to you. Then, almost immediately after making this promise, you find yourself, or after God makes this promise, you find yourself attacked by your brothers, your life threatened before you're sold into slavery. This is the kind of stuff that causes forks in the road of our faith. If we're honest, uh, these events are, are likely to, to torpedo any faith that we may have had in those dreams in the first place. But something about the dreams forged in Joseph a confidence. His story carries on, and then we see that everything he puts his hand to is blessed. His owner, Potiphar, sees how God is working in, in Joseph's life and everything's just going right for him. And so he gives him more and more responsibility. Ultimately, he is set as the, the manager of the household. He was running the show. And Joseph was a looker. Unfortunately, he caught the eye of the, the wrong woman, Potiphar's wife. She propositioned him, propositioned him and, and he turned her down. And as, as Shakespeare once said, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Joseph was ultimately jailed for being a sexual predator, something he, he didn't do. Again, this could cause a faith crisis. The promised destiny for Joseph had taken another turn for the terrible. A man who was promised leadership and authority shouldn't be being dragged off to jail. But the dream that God had given Joseph was strong enough to sustain him even in the depths of that jail cell. To his credit, and to the credit of the dream giver, Joseph was convinced that this wasn't the end of his journey. God gave him the ability to look beyond his present situation to the horizon where someday God would do this thing and do his thing in Joseph's life. Once again, God blessed Joseph in that everything that he put his hand to uh, just went well, and so he was promoted to the point where he was in charge of all the other prisoners. And just as Potiphar once did, the, the keeper of the prison just fully trusted Joseph with responsibilities, knowing that everything that he gave him to do would be done to the best of anybody's ability. While in jail, God spoke to some of the prisoners through dreams, and this time Joseph was given the gift of interpretation. He was able to tell the prisoners the good news and the bad news about what their dreams meant. And not surprisingly, the interpretations were spot on. And Joseph, his reputation grew until one fateful day when Pharaoh, the king of all of Egypt, needed help interpreting some of his dreams. Joseph was, was fetched and God gave him again the, the gift of interpreting the dreams. The interpretation provided a warning and a way out of trouble for Egypt. Pharaoh, again king of all Egypt, was so moved by Joseph's interpretation that he installed him as top man. Joseph was going to lead the way as Egypt took advantage of seven years of plenty in preparation for seven years of famine. Joseph was 30 years old when he was given the role of being second in charge of all of Egypt. This in itself could be seen as the fulfillment of God's dream promise. But God wasn't done. Uh, Genesis 42-47 to describes the, the surprising interactions between Joseph and his brothers. You see, um, the famine didn't just hit Egypt. It hit all of the land, uh, including Joseph's family back home. And they didn't have this prophetic word to prepare in those seven years of plenty 
for the seven years of famine and they were hit hard and they needed food and word had got out that for whatever reason Egypt had planned ahead had stored up food and had food to sell and so Jacob otherwise known as Israel sent his sons to go to Egypt and, and try and buy food from Egypt to bring home well in the end it was just as God said it would be in the dreams the brothers ended up bowing down at Joseph's feet. But the narrative of the story about the humbling of his brothers, sorry, the narrative of the story was less about the humbling of his brothers and more about the work that God was going to do using Joseph. This is where we can get it wrong. Yes, Joseph demonstrates incredible character throughout his incredible journeys. But too often we lose sight of what it was that was Joseph, what it was that Joseph clung to. How was it that he was able to maintain his faith in the promise that God had given him so long ago in a dream, in two dreams? In the end, there was an unbreakable, an unshakable connection to what Joseph believed. Despite having his life threatened, being sold into slavery, and being unjustly imprisoned, Joseph held to the promise that God had given him. Joseph was given every reason to fall into fear and despair. But where hopelessness made sense, he had hope. Uh, who of us could use this kind of hope? Who of us would benefit from a faith as strong as the one between Joseph and God? Obviously, this is a rhetorical question. The real question is how? How can we get this kind of hope? How can we have a faith as strong as the one between Joseph and God? We live in a time of ubiquitous fear. In, in my life, I had never known people to, to battle anxiety and stress the way they do today. We're not being dragged to our death or, or sold into slavery or falsely imprisoned. But the fear and anxiety is still very real. Noah had faith that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. Abraham had faith that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. And we see Joseph had faith that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. The question is, do we have faith that God is going to do what he said he was going to do? or what he says he's going to do. Actually, you know, this question creates a need for more questions. Uh, first, and this is going right back to the beginning of this message, do we even believe there is a God? Like, do you really believe? Uh, do you know why you believe, if you do believe? And if, even if, even if you really believe that there is a God, this brings us to our second point, do you believe that he has a plan for your life? If so, what is it? Now this is a chunky bit of theology. In hindsight, we see Noah's family would be saved from the flood. In hindsight, we see that Abraham eventually had a family, one that would make up God's chosen people. In hindsight, we see that Joseph did in fact rise to power and was able to save the world from starvation. But does everybody get a promise? Has God promised you something? Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You see, things worked out for Noah eventually. Things worked out for Abraham eventually. And things worked out for Joseph eventually. All three of these men had more than enough reason to be fearful and anxious. And in some cases, we get to see this fear and, and doubt manifested. But in the end, they believed in God's promise to work everything for his good. You may not know the exact methods that God will use to carry out his good plan for you and your life. But you can know that he's up to something. Don't believe the lie that you were born just so that you could take up space and then eventually die. You were created for a purpose. And in the meanwhile... Philippians 4.9 tells that he has promised 
to supply every need that we have. We won't lack for anything that we truly need. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says that he has promised that his grace is is sufficient for us. That means he'll cover the costs that we can't actually pay. 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us that he promises that nobody will be tempted to the point where he can't get us out of that trouble. He can't help us through it. Acts 2.32 promises, vic- promises us victory even over death. So what do we do with this? Ultimately, it's about believing and committing our ways to him. When we believe that God is God, and we commit our lives to him, we put ourselves on his path, the path toward the promise that he has for us. Sometimes we get to know what that destiny is, like Noah, Abraham, and Joseph. But sometimes we just need to trust the destiny giver. Today, we want to take a time to get back on that path. Communion is one of those checkpoints where we get to get back on course. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26 says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Uh, If you're sharing communion with us today, just, just hold this bread while we pray over it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, that you've made yourself real to us. You've made yourself available to be known. And so today I, I pray over those people who have got this fog between them and you, that, that the world has muddled their minds and their hearts with all these ideas. Lord, I pray that you would break through and reveal yourself to us today. That we would know you in a fresh way. And for those, for those of us who are, are already kind of in lockstep, Lord, we pray that you would um, be remembered in this moment. We pray that as we come together as brothers and sisters, that we would put you first and remember you. Put you at the front of our minds. And remember what you did when your body was broken for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the bread to God. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Again, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for what you did on the cross for us, where you paid the price. So again, that we could have this relationship with you, the relationship that Noah had with you, Abraham had with you, and Joseph had with you. We can have that relationship. We can know your power. We can know your majesty. Thank you for what you did. And and today, Lord, I I want to pray a special prayer that we would remember the power of the blood. And if we have people in our lives that are are sick or hurt, Lord, I pray that you would remind us that by the power of your blood, we can pray for them and see them healed, see them restored. Not because we're great, not because we have great faith, but because you are a great God. Thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood for us. Amen. Let's take the cup together. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, If you've got the feeling that there's still a lot more to be learned about how we can have a faith like Noah's, Abraham's, and Joseph's, uh, a faith that is unshakable, well, you're right. The good news is that we'll keep hitting this idea of faith for several more weeks. Uh, Until next week, I pray that you will know who you serve and why you serve him. And that is, and that this understanding would fuel your faith in him. Be blessed and have a great day.